love mathematics. There is something about it that stimulates my brain in just the right way to make all the nice feel-good chemicals come out. It gets me in the same way as solving a puzzle thrills someone else. However, I have two massive problems when it comes to mathematics. The first is I have a tiny bit of doubt that under all of my love for mathematics is a strange form of performance. And I don't really actually love mathematics at all, but it's all a massive act. But apart from that imposter syndrome, I have a more fundamental problem. I do not know what a number is. Now, another Ruth has done a wonderful video titled, What is a number? It is a perfectly reasonable video doing all that that video wants to do. However, it doesn't actually answer the question in its title. The video is a kind of lie and I suspect that Alex of Another Roof knows that it's a lie. Though not the type of evil lie that it is attempting to mislead, but more lies told to students, where you simplify a complex subject by leaving out the things that would distract or confuse. Now, in this otherwise totally acceptable video, Alex answers the question by showing a way to construct the counting also called the natural numbers, from sets in set theory. He then goes on to explain how to build up from the counting numbers to the whole numbers, from the whole numbers to the rational numbers, and on to the badly named reals, and the not so poorly named complex numbers. To explain why I feel this answer is unsatisfactory, I am going to use an analogy. Imagine if you asked a structural engineer what a house was and they answered by telling you how to build a house. You understand why that misses the point of the question? You can't just point to the result of following a building plan and say, that's what a house is. I want to know how to distinguish between things that are houses and things that are not houses. What is even worse with Alex's explanation for me is that I am cursed with knowing a little bit too much. To continue with the house building analogy, when the structural engineer explains how to build a brick house, since I know that there are houses made of wood and houses made of straw, I also think that his definition of a house might be lacking. What Alex gave was a wonderful explanation of how to construct the counting numbers from nested sets. These are called von Neumann. That name kind of gives the game away, doesn't it? If this was the only way of constructing counting numbers, wouldn't we just call them the counting numbers? If we have to give it a name to distinguish it from other constructions, that's a clue that other constructions exist. An alternative construction of the counting numbers that I'm aware of is called the church numerals. Not because these numbers are somehow religious. The religious numbers, of course, are the cardinal numbers who are responsible for the election of the math pope. The church numerals are named after Lorenzo Church, the professor who supervised Alan Turing's PhD and is almost as responsible for the field of computer science as Turing is. The church numerals are an alternative system of encoding the counting numbers using lambda calculus, which I'm not going to go into depth about because if you started me talking about lambda calculus, it would be impossible to tell when I would stop, but it is a way of representing mathematics and computation in the form of a system of string substitutions. But that's not the only system that you can construct to model the counting numbers. When I did my video on gender and fixed point logic, I briefly mentioned 
that you could create the counting numbers by taking the fixed point of the maybe type. Indeed, it is really super easy to create new ways to construct the counting numbers. Sometimes I've even done this for fun. The thing is that I am sure that Alex from Another Roof knows all of this just as well. We all have to make decisions about what we explain and what we leave out. Otherwise, we would end up with videos that were overwhelming and didn't make sense. The thing about all these different constructions of the counting numbers is that they all follow the same rules. They behave in the same way. Perhaps, rather than defining numbers based on how they are constructed, we should define them on how they behave. This is the solution to this problem that Giuseppe Piano decided on. The following rules are called the Piano axioms for counting numbers. Zero is a counting number. We don't define what zero refers to. It's just zero. For my postmodernist friends, it is a floating signifier. Sometimes times the piano axiom start at one, which personally is very odd to me, but I'm not going to attack somebody else's culture. A number system with just zero is kind of empty and not really useful. Let's get a way of introducing new numbers. If square is a counting number, then S square is a counting number. S stands for successor. In other words, the next number after. Even though it is clearly intended for S0 to be 1, we haven't removed the possibility that there is only 0 and the S function loops around on itself. So let's introduce a new rule to do that. For every counting number square, S square equals 0 is false. Great. Now we have 0 and S0. In other words, zero and one. Though we've sort of shifted our looping problem across by one step. Since we can have S zero equals SS zero, can we fix that? Let's introduce another axiom to clean that particular problem up. For every pair of counting numbers, square and triangle, if S square equals S triangle, then square equals triangle. Basically, two different numbers can't reach the same successor. This stops any chain arising from zero forming a loop because at some point in the chain coming up from zero, the chain would have to join the loop. That would create the situation where two different numbers would have the same successor. However, it is not perfect as it doesn't exclude a freestanding loop that doesn't originate from zero. Let's introduce one last axiom for that. You know when I said that sometimes we have to lie in maths explainer videos on the internet to prevent them from getting too long and distracted by complex minutiae? Lies told to students, where you simplify a complex subject by leaving out the things that would distract or confuse. This is one of the things I'm going to have to lie about for every property. If zero has that property and assuming square also has that property allows you to prove that S square also has that property, then all counting numbers have that property. This is the principle of induction and I love inductive proofs so very much. This principle of induction will safely banish any non-standard construction of the counting numbers away. We don't have to worry about any non-standard numbers in our counting numbers. The principle of induction as stated by me in this video is completely standard and completely unproblematic. Bing! Incompatible with the logic we use for everyday or mathematics is just a minor technicality 
that you don't have to worry about. Please ignore anybody who says anything about second order logic, axiom schemas, or the Llewellyn Scholem Scholem theorem. These are unimportant distractions that are not worth your consideration. The remaining piano axioms go on to define addition, multiplication, and order. With them in place, no matter how we construct counting, so long as we follow the piano axioms, they will behave in the same way. If we have a counting system that is constructed from bushels of wheat, it will behave in exactly the same way as a counting system constructed of marks on clay tablets. If you do addition and subtraction on the clay tablets, it will correspond to the adding and removal of wheat in the stores. This sympathy between different systems is super useful if you happen to be a society that grows wheat and stores it in a centralized granary. So we have finally defined the counting numbers, but that really hasn't solved my problem, has it? Like I said before, if we have to give something an extra name, that suggests that we need to distinguish it from something else. There are more to numbers than just the counting numbers. Shocking, I know. The counting numbers are extended into the whole numbers, which are also called the integers. The wholes are extended into the rationals, and the rationals are extended into the still badly named reals. Now, for each of these number types, we could do a bottom-up construction of them. Alternatively, we could do a top-down axiomic definition. One of my earliest videos was me doing a top-down axionic definition of the real numbers. In part, out of frustration for another YouTube video that defined the real numbers in a very poor way. Actually, the fact that I get aggravated over YouTube videos about about math subjects kind of means that I don't think this is at all performative. I think I just care a lot about math. Well, that sort of solves the imposter syndrome. How about the rest of it? Maybe a good definition of what a number is, is the counting numbers, and anything that is an extension on those numbers is also a number. So by definition, the wholes, the rationals, and the reals, they are all numbers. And the reals can be extended into the complex numbers, which most people agree are numbers. Excellent. The complex numbers can be further extended into the quaternions, which you might have come across if you've done any computer 3D programming. I don't see many references to the quaternion numbers compared to the complex numbers. The next extension to on the quaternions is the octonions, and nobody thinks those are numbers. Perhaps if we can tell what's the difference between the quaternions and the complex numbers, we will understand what is the secret source that makes numbers numbers. Well, one big difference between the quaternions and the complex numbers is that for the complex numbers, multiplication commutes. That is, square times triangle equals triangle times square. It doesn't matter what side of the time sign the complex number is on, multiplication works the same way. However, for quaternions, it does matter what order you do your multiplication. This is handy because there's another extension on top of the numbers called matrices. We can add and multiply matrices, but matrices also don't compute. That, is, that seems settled then. Any extension to the counting numbers is a number so long as they commute. Oh dear, there's still more running time on this video. I suspect I'm missing something. Hold on. Didn't I make a joke about some sort of holy numbers? The religious numbers, of course, are the cardinal numbers, who are responsible for the election of the math pope. Oh yes, the cardinal numbers. These, along with the ordinal numbers, 
extend the counting numbers beyond the limitations of the finite. These are the transfinite numbers. And since everybody calls them numbers, I guess they must be. That's fine, since they are an extension to the counting numbers, they fit our current definition of what a number is. And just let me check, I'm sure that multiplication and addition commute for these numbers. Damn it! Ordinal addition and multiplication don't commute. Ah, oh, my definition doesn't work. And honestly, I thought I was going to end the video here. With me left just as ignorant to what a number is as when I started. And then I would have to work out how to transition smoothly into asking people to subscribe. You know, YouTube stuff. But something happened while I was doing the research for this video and thinking it over. I didn't find anyone with a good definition, not one that satisfied me at least, but I realised something. What if I'm approaching the idea of classifying numbers from a wrong direction? How about we take an approach that's a bit more taxonomic? Taxonomy is the science of classifying living things into various groups and various species. The idea is that we will pick a holotype, an example of what a number is, then we'll say that things that are like that holotype are numbers, and things that are too different from the holotype are not numbers. So I'm thinking we select the counting numbers as our holotype specimen for numbers and decide our bounds of numberishness based on that. The wholes, the rationals and the reals, they have a great deal in common with the counting numbers and everybody agrees. These are numbers. The complex numbers, they commute like the counting numbers but you can't put complex numbers in an order, but they have enough in common with the counting numbers to be considered numbers. The ordinal numbers don't commute, but they have order, so they are also number-like enough to be numbers. The quaternions don't commute and don't have order, so we can feel safe thinking that they're not numbers. So, my personal definition of what a number is, is the counting numbers as defined by the piano axioms, and anything that behaves mostly like a counting number. However, I am fully aware of my limitations as a person. Is there something that's widely regarded as a number that my definition excludes? Is there something that isn't like a number that my definition includes? Please tell me in the comments. And while I'm doing this call to action, could you also subscribe?